Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. Are you looking for a way to connect with your loved one? Maybe an activity to do the next time you visit? Something other than sitting around and answering the same questions over and over again like we always seem to do? Let me tell you about some books that I discovered that changed the last visit I had with mom tremendously. They're called Two Lap Books. They are simple, read aloud books for memory challenged adults. You see, people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementias gradually lose their ability to initiate communication with others. Because of this, these uniquely adapted books, quote, give voice to these loved ones. By using the book's large, simple text and colorful illustrations, we can initiate conversations. Most noteworthy, reading books together can make meaningful connections with our loved ones and help stimulate their mind. Caregivers will enjoy sharing these books and creating purposeful, interactive activities for engaging people with memory deficits. Best of all, reading these books together will very likely bring out memories that you can share together. I've made it super easy for you guys to check out these books. The link to the Amazon page is in the show notes, so give it a click. I know you and your loved ones will get a tremendous amount of enjoyment together reading these books. Mom enjoyed them, her friends enjoyed them, and I enjoyed an afternoon with them like I haven't had in a very long time. With the winter months coming, Mom and I won't be able to go outside on our little adventures, so we'll definitely be reading these books a lot more as the colder weather envelops us and keeps us inside. I've got a really good one for you guys today. Today, I have a conversation with Tiffany Matthews. She is a healthcare advocate, and she's going to be talking to us today about becoming more healthcare literate. Managing your healthcare and treatment, as well as navigating a broken healthcare system, is super overwhelming. No matter how savvy and smart you are, it is easy to mishandle important aspects of your care. This can lead to disaster. Get the help you need to avoid that right here by getting healthcare literate, with, starting with my conversation with Tiffany. We kind of jumped right into talking about this subject. It's something that Tiffany is super passionate about. So jump right in with us and let's learn more about healthcare advocacy and stay tuned next week for part two. As I said, Tiffany is super passionate and this conversation went for almost two hours and could have gone for longer. Found you on Instagram and mm-hmm. I was um, drawn to your, your account name was Our Healthcare Sucks. <laughs> I just changed it recently. Oh, yes. did you? To what? Yeah. Oh. I changed it from um, LBB advocate, patient advocate lady. Ah. And I wanted people to get the point of what I was saying immediately. Well, I definitely so. did. I have had the, uh, um, what do you want to call it? The privilege, so to speak. And I'm making air quotes here of purchasing mm-hmm. private health insurance since January of 92. And I can, I can tell you that ugh, I don't know what we need to do to fix our health care, but it, the, it's too expensive for what we get. Right. You know, how did you, how did you come to wanting to be a health care advocate? What, what prompted you? Well, there were, there were certain things that had happened, you know, in my life. I was a social worker in um, hospitals, nursing facilities, aging agencies, um, different kinds of places. And I wasn't happy with my social work career, but, um, you know, paid the bills somewhat. So, you know, yeah, somewhat, definitely. You don't go into social work to get rich. You that is definitely. True. And, um, you know, I always made a practice, um, especially when I was in the hospital, of kind of keeping people at a distance because you have to. If you take all of their problems home with you, you'll be no good for yeah. your own family, crushed. you know. But it wasn't until it happened to me and my family that I really understood what I was doing and what I was a part of. 
and I, you know, I, it's okay. My grandmother, she became, uh, she got a surgery and after that surgery, her health just went completely downhill. Mm -hmm. And over the next, um, 16 months, she was like dying before our eyes. And my grandmother, she's like my second mom, you know, Mm -hmm. she lived upstairs. We lived downstairs. So, you know, better than any grandchild, I was, you know, I knew her and I was there with her, you know, she's there for me when I'm sick or, you know, when I'm in trouble, I'll be like, go tell my mom not to put me in trouble, you know, and (laughs) she'd be like, she'd be like, now you're not going to beat the baby. You're not going to do that. (laughs) You know, old black woman type of, You know, and she's like, you're not going to beat the baby. And I mean, then you get to a point in the hospital, she's dying, basically. And you've told us, but you're pressuring us as to what to do. Okay, you're going to pull the life support or you're going to put her on hospice. Yeah. And we got beat down with that, like repeatedly. Now, I wasn't there. I was working. I lived 300 miles away. I wasn't physically there, but emotionally, mentally, and everything else, I was there, you know? Mm-hmm. And the the treatment she got was just horrible. I said, this is a woman with not two, but three insurances. <laughs> We're not worried about payment here. Because she worked for the state of New York, you know, she had Medicare, and then she had, like, AARP or something like that. That sounds like my and, mom. Yeah. So don't give me any crap about payments. So my mom calls me. She's like, you know what? I'm going to jump out of the first window I see. I was like, what are you talking about? Oh, uh, the social worker, they're going to put her out. We don't have test results. She just had a surgery. We don't know what's happening with that. They're making us take her home with a trach. None of us are home. We all work. She needs 24 hour care. I said, mom, chill out. Okay. Just chill out. Have the social worker call me and you go get a coffee. <laughs> Okay. She said, okay. And my mom, she's really one of those, like, I'm always right. I don't need help with anything type women. Oh, I don't know anybody like that. (laughs) Oh yeah. 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 (laughs) So, um, I just was like, let me take the ball into my hands. And when I was that far away, I felt so helpless. Like I couldn't do anything, but this time I could do something because I knew what to do. I played the game already. Right. So social worker called me. She's like, yes, your grandmother's um, going to be discharged because her insurances aren't going to pay anymore. I said, sweetheart, which one of the three are you talking about? And then there was silence. I said, see, I play the same game that you do every day. And what you're not going to do, that little black lady in the corner room, you're going to leave her alone. Or else I'll have the Joint Commission, the Department of Health. And the Center for Medicare and Medicaid in there looking through her files to see exactly how you treated my grandmother. And Are so we understanding one another? See, I'm laughing because it's like you put the fear in them. That's fantastic. But it's so it should never be necessary. Exactly. Why do I have to basically threaten you for you to do the job you're being paid for? That's what I didn't get. And when I I told her that, I said, you have a nice day. My mom calls me back about a half hour later. Did you threaten her? (laughs) What did you do to her? What did you say? Did you threaten her? Mom, no. I just told her what I was going to do. It wasn't a threat. It was a guarantee. It was a promise. Definitely. That was going to get done. You're not going to treat that lady any old way. And, you know, when she passed away, you know how, like, when people pass away, you kind of think of your own life and... Like, man, am I doing the right things? Am I, you know, you kind of reflect a little. Mm -hmm. And I said, how many other people need this kind of help? She's not the only one they treat like that. I've been a party to it. I said, I have to do something. And my business was born. (laughs) So you and And I kind of started something, a new venture from a similar place out of a need for dealing with this industry, so to speak. Right. Absolutely. I saw the people that I grew up around destroyed. My grandmother, she was like a tower of power to me. And she was this, she had become this shell of a person. And I saw my uncles, like who I always thought were strong, crying 
And I was like, it can't, it doesn't have to be this damn difficult. You know, it doesn't have to be. So I always say, I don't want another family to feel like mine did. Because instead of having to concentrate on the fact that our matriarch was dying, we had to concentrate on the fact of the business of healthcare. Okay, what are we going to do that's going to make them money so they'll let her stay there? Yeah. That's my problem. And instead of looking at patients for the beautiful individuals they are, it's all about profit. And I can prove it. I've been in those little meetings and backroom you know, things like conferences and things like that, where they say, okay, but she's not making any money anymore. When did her insurance stop paying? A week ago. Well, she should have been gone. Well, you just cut her chest open. I mean, (laughs) sorry, she's there a few more days. Yeah. That's kind of what we we dealt with with my dad. He was um, diabetic. And Mm -hmm. my husband, daughter, and I showed up On the 29th of November, 2016, I had been out of town. My husband and I went on vacation for my 50th birthday. And when I came home, I called my dad and made some arrangements. Um, He was spending Thanksgiving with my sister. And so I said, well, I'm going to be in your town that that Tuesday. Why don't we, meaning my, my family, come over you know, we can visit and put up some decoration, Christmas decorations for mom because I knew he didn't have the strength and, and she can't figure out how to put it up. So um, my husband showed up first. Well, the, the phone conversation I had with my dad was fine. Then it was either the hours later or the next day I get an email kind of like, verifying and questioning what we had talked about. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd, but you know, it wasn't that odd, but it was different, but it wasn't, it wasn't a huge warning sign. And then he didn't spend Thanksgiving with my sister because he wasn't feeling well. And we went over there that Tuesday and his mind was back in 1998. And I remember thinking, Holy Mm. hell, I have two parents with dementia. Now what the hell do I do? What's wrong with him? So we forced him to the hospital. I knew he had a donated kidney, and I knew it was not functioning properly because he had told Mm. me. And he didn't want to go back on dialysis, which I also knew. So I, I knew what his wishes were, but I had no idea what was going on with him. So he ends up spending 32 days in the hospital. Oh. And of course, you know, they say, oh, you know, if we, the, he's, all these toxins have built up in his system. If we clear the toxins out by doing dialysis, his memory should come back. You know, my sister was very hopeful that that was true. I figured if that was going to be the case, it would have happened after a week, 10 days tops. Well, at 32 days, they, you know, they release him. They're, you know, they're releasing him. But I talked to his, his personal kidney doctor on the phone. You know, and she said, well, now somebody's going to have to drive your dad to dialysis three days a week. And because his memory hasn't improved, somebody's going to have to sit with him the whole time. And I said, excuse me, we all work. I said, exactly. it, what, I said, I, I don't, this is not what we discussed. And I'm like, and it was very obvious to me that she just expected me as the oldest sibling, you know, the oldest child to just handle it. And I'm like, no. And I said, you seem to be forgetting that he has a very clear, clear health directive. If he needs to be babysat at dialysis, which are two things he will not want, then we need to call hospice. Next thing I know, I heard a dial tone. So I was like, yeah, I was not impressed. They released him and his, and he knew he had this gap in his memory. And my sister was so hopeful. She just, she was like, she drove him past our, the location of our old family business. Cause that's where, that's where his mind was back at in that era. And mm-hmm. he was very excited to, to fill this gap. And so she was pretty sure he would. I, I've always been much more negative and I was like, well, I'm hopeful, but I'm not holding my breath because it's been 32 days and he's still, you know, he seems bright and, you know, he's obviously aware that, 
you know, he's got this gap. And so I thought, well, that's better than my mom's ever had. So that was where my hope came from. But three days later, he fell and he ended up in a different hospital that I like a lot better. And their kidney doctors were fantastic because his um, heart was not strong enough for dialysis. And the hospital nephrologist called and talked to me. And she was explaining all the stuff they were trying to do. And I just flat out said, you know what? This is what his health directive said. And she went, oh, okay. And we went right into the discussion of hospice. And I was so relieved. I I was sitting in my car in a parking lot, and I was almost in tears. I was so relieved because she didn't hang up on me. She didn't argue with me. And I thought, oh, okay, well, this is the way it's supposed to be. And then when I went to when he was being released and I'd already done all the hospice stuff, there was a different kidney doctor in the room and they were doing dialysis on him, which I was like, what are we doing? Or is this just like the last ditch to jack up the bill some more? And I saw her standing there and I thought, oh, great. Now I have to have this conversation with a third doctor. Mm -hmm. And he was in the room. And so she, she started asking me some questions and I, I answered in a way that she understood that we needed to have this conversation out in the hall. And then I told her what was going on. And she goes, well, that's probably the right decision. And I almost fainted. I was like so relieved because I thought, you know, it's been six or seven weeks, or about six weeks, seven weeks of dealing with doctors and all this confusion. And my we were transporting my mom back and forth. And, you know, my house, my sister's house, her sister was staying there for a while. And then when we knew... Dad was coming home. We had in-home caregivers for the two of them. And it was just, it was just stress and it was terrible. And I just Mm -hmm. remember thinking two things. One, I wish he had just said that he really felt like he was declining and we needed to decide what to do because he didn't think he'd make it to Christmas 2017. I wish we'd had that conversation on never understand why we didn't because the stress that my sister and I and our husbands and my, my daughter who had just turned 25 and my niece who was 12 at the time, she's also a November baby. She's the 10th, um, Mm. you know, and even her younger brother who is mild autism, you know, it's just like the stress was so unnecessary. And then the hospital adding to it was just awful. Right. So, you know, so it's I that's where I come from and you know, and I I always feel like well I've I've dealt with a friend whose mom lived in the same community. Um another resident pushed her, not they're not really sure what happened, and she ended up with a broken leg. Oh gosh. Yeah. And I guess now, and I don't know if this is nationwide or just California, but you're not allowed in like a nursing facility to basically put a sign on the door that says this patient has, her mom has frontal temporal dementia from a stroke. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't put their memory impaired on the door. And HIPAA violation. Yeah, which is stupid because, and they can't put bed rails on either. So they've got people falling out of bed. They got doctors trying to get information out of people who have no clue what's going on. I'm like, what the heck? So I'm working with our Alzheimer's associate association. Um, She's the legislative uh, ambassador. It's like all these titles Mm. gets really lengthy. And she was not aware of that. And so I'm trying to hook her up with this gal who's dealt with these, you know, on top of dealing with her poor mom. Now she has to deal with this stupid rules that make no sense. Right. And that's what keeps healthcare dangerous um, with astronomical costs. And it always seems like when people say, okay, we need to save money in healthcare, the first thing they think is, okay, we've got to get people off of insurance. That's not the way to go. There'll be people dead in the street. Yeah, honestly. But the way to go is, you know, I'm trying patient advocacy and health literacy. The more health literate our patients are, the more they know what to ask for, when to ask for it, and they can make better 
shared decisions with their providers about their plan of treatment or plan of care. It lends to disease management. It lends to um, health care disparities, all of that. And I, for years, I had went on like saying, OK, I'm going to advocate for patients. But how? There's so many different things that can be done because there's so many issues that need to be addressed. I know some people who do just the billing portion of the program, medical billing. They'll go through your stuff, find the errors, find you savings, and there you go. And you pay them a percentage of the savings. I know people who work with strictly dementia clients and families, strictly cancer clients and families. But for me, I do, my, my point is accessing and retaining good care and treatment. And you have to know what to do, how to do. And I wrote a line of eBooks. Well, they're not gonna be eBooks anymore. They're gonna be audio lessons for people um, with 20 different modules. It's called the Powerful Patient Partner Program. And I'm teaching people to be health lit, healthcare literate, you know, in it. You can say to your doctor, no, we're not doing this. You know, yeah, it's, people are so intimidated and and fearful and ashamed of some of the things that happen that you you're not going to be able to get the best health care if you don't share that kind of stuff. It's mental. It's emotional. It's physical. It's all these different aspects that patients and their caregivers need to learn. So you know, where, where would you suggest somebody like my sister and I start? with for our mom her doctor resigned from the group that he's in i'm not sure if he went somewhere else fortunately for us mom does not need a lot of you know i don't have to take her to the doctor all the time like some of my friends i mean i have one friend at the gym taking her mom to the doctor like every week for different things and i'm so glad i don't have to do that because i don't have the patience for that either and my sister doesn't right. have the time but you know the one thing I went with her in January, I believe, and said um, she needed her ears cleaned out because her hearing was dramatically decreasing. And I know from dealing with a billing issue that she had had that done in November of 2016. So it was a pretty logical guess that that was the issue, which was the case. I probably should take her back because they did say six months and we're a little past that. But yeah. Um, I basically said I had to keep telling them I need to see her diagnosis. I need to find out details. My sister and I are kind of working in the dark. I mean, yes, we know she has Alzheimer's and I assumed she was diagnosed in 08. I found out she was actually diagnosed in 2011, which is a joke because, I mean, I knew she had dementia and memory issues well before they retired, which was in 2005. So Wow. It's crazy. But I always feel like it's me against that staff. They did do what right. I want, asked for that day, but it took way too long. We were there an hour and a half. And I, you know, I, I almost feel like I have to threaten them about making sure the billing is, is done properly because I dealt with them for months, months mm -hmm. and months over a bill. They, I don't know. I don't even know what they were doing wrong, but I just kept telling them she's got Medicare She's got this, you know, Cadillac insurance through the phone company. Don't be telling me that I owe you $320 for an office visit. I was with that her at one of those office visits, and it's not worth $320. Bucks. So don't give me that baloney, which, of course, they didn't appreciate. But I spent hours on the phone trying to get them paid because that's the right thing to do. And I finally just looked at them and said, if you guys can't get it billed properly, then – Suck it up, because I'm not gonna. Yep. I'm not gonna do this anymore. Right, and it's the truth. But for how you stood up for yourself and your mother, many people don't have the understanding that anything's wrong in the first place. Those are the ones I want to help. You know, those are the ones that even if they looked at the bill, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Oh, I better just pay it when it could be tens of thousands of dollars off. I worked in an advocacy company and a guy came in and he had his arm in a sling and he was like, you know, um, I got this bill 
And I looked at it and he had it highlighted. It said pelvic exam. (laughs) On a man. I was like, wait a minute, let me get my readers. Okay. (laughs) He said, you don't have to get your readers. It's true. I said, a pelvic exam from a GYN? (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, he said, and I wasn't even there for that. I was there for my arm. (laughs) I said, you've got to be kidding me that it is this ridiculous. You've got to be kidding me. And people have no clue. They feel that they're just slaves to how healthcare goes now. Put it like this. If I went to McDonald's, which I will never do again, because the food is ridiculous and horrible for you. Yeah. But if you went there and you asked for a cheeseburger and you got a hamburger, you're going to say something, right? Yeah. Why don't people do that in their health care? Uh, obviously, it's because, you know, it's it's a challenge and we're mm-hmm. I don't think they let us I and mean, we're not educated, I guess, on what we should do. Right. And some of the smartest people I've ever met are very, very low in their health literacy. That's the problem. And this is, you know, it's not a substitute for intelligence. It's a real skill that needs to be learned by everyone and everyone that takes care of someone. I have to advocate for my daughter. I, you know, when I had my own health issues, like in 2014, it was just a bad year for me health wise. I mean, really, I had two surgeries. I had, um, you know, a cardiac event. I had all these things, you know. Good thing I got rid of what caused the uh, cardiac event. <laughs> Six foot, 200 pounds to buy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know... Even advocating for myself was hard. And I said, why is the system this difficult for people? But what I realized is the system's not going to change anytime soon. No. So there has to be another force that changes it. And I said, patience, we have to be the ones. So I came up with this. It took a long time to come to fruition and, you know, what my ideas were. Because, you know, after my grandmother, I was just very angry for a while at the whole healthcare system. But I was like, I have to come out of this, you know? And I said, I have, like, I have a um, master's in journalism from Temple, and I love writing. So I just started writing, and it helped me get my frustration out. And when I looked at it, I said, I can use this stuff. People need to know. And that was my, that's my main thing in starting um, LBB. You know, for me, it's, it's a passion and I love it. I would do it even if I won the lottery. (laughs) I'd do it for free, you know, then. But now I can't do that, you know. So, you know, I put out um, services. I do care planning. I do support phone calls for people. Like people in your situation, you need a plan, You need a plan to get out of this. You need to know who to call, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. And then we, you know, go on to the next topic, environment. You know, I talk about different things with people, finances. What are you going to do with advanced directives? All of these different things. You need a plan to be able to address what mom needs, you know, in and out of where she lives, you know, and because for, it, fortunately it, for yeah. us, my dad was, well, my husband and I are third generation Rotarians and he and I are in a group of about 80 people. So we're blessed that we have other people who have been through this and, you know, there's a CPA in our group that, you know, didn't, he didn't, I guess I'm trying to think of like the word, like he didn't use social politeness to hinder his asking, you know, tell me about your parents' house. Is it, is it paid for? Is it under, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with California's prop 13 taxes, which is, it's always a big issue around here, but it, it means their property taxes are super, super low. And he told my husband, he said, you should rent out your parent, your in-laws house and help take care of your mom instead of selling it. And my husband is a realtor and a property manager, and it hadn't really occurred to him that we should do that. I think he thought about it, but 
not he think I think he thought about it as a son in law, not as an I'm a professional in this industry and I, I I could make this decision on my own. So we were very blessed that we had people that we could lean on and and you know, ask questions of. And I've I've told people that I don't know what we would have done without them. And so right. but I'm sure probably ninety nine percent of our group could learn more about healthcare and more about advocating. So that's why I wanted to talk to you. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, I, what I do, I do a lot of virtual stuff. Most of my um, program, well, all of my program is digital and I'm still working on it. I'm still working toward the launch in November. I want to be ready for open enrollment. That would be perfect. uh, Yeah. I will help you get it out get the word out. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, since, you know, now open enrollment's been shortened and, you know, people do not even want to look or deal with what insurance they have or they're getting. That'll cost you. That will cost you, especially if there is an emergency, God forbid, you know, Mm -hmm. and they need to know what I don't tell people what to do. I just inform them so they can make their own choices, you know, as to what to do. I inform them of how the healthcare system works. It's not in your favor. It's not in the patient's favor. It's always in favor of the facility and, you know, whoever's um, bringing in money to the facility. That's all it's about. Profits over patients. And I can't stand that. That's our lives. Well, That's our lives. We've all worked and they really work. hard to, you know, pay those bills. You know, I feel like we should have a lot better choices than we do. Now, do they have Kaiser in um, where you're at? You're in Pennsylvania? Yeah, no, they don't have Kaiser okay. out here. But still, it's a huge name. Kaiser Permanente, yeah, yeah. huge name. Because that's what my husband and I have, mm. and we've we have we've had some um, what's the right word we we have had some benefits of their not for profit, which you know was very helpful when I broke my collarbone two years ago in a bicycle accident. Didn't have health insurance because, like I said, we're self employed, and right. it's. $1,200 a month for the two of us. Then it costs more to even go to the doctor. That just some There's just some times when you, know, you don't have an extra $1,200 a month. Yeah, um, exactly. So my whole thought is all health care should be not for profit. Because if you're not attempting to make every last dime on grandma or this sick kid... I, I I see that as a very good first step in the direction our country needs to go. I don't know if that's true. Well, I've worked for healthcare, and the hospital I worked for was a. It's it really comes down to semantics. Nonprofit, not for profit, and for profit. That not for profit, yeah, they're not, but they still want it. Well, it's hard to so run without it. it. That's that's where their aim is. It may not be for a profit. Yeah, okay, you can't look that way, but that's what you're doing. If this, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> no, I'm so you're passionate, passionate about, about it. <laughs> yes, I am because it's so mean and vicious. I had to put out of the hospital this 80 year old lady, and I worked in Buffalo. It was during the winter. She came in in an ambulance. They cut her clothes off of her. Okay. I said, you know, I went into her room. I said, honey, you know, it's time. um, Your doctor said it's time to go. She's like, oh, great. I just don't have any clothes. I said, well, how about this? How about I run to your house real quick, go get you some clothes and bring them back. I said, do you have anybody that can watch me while I'm in your apartment? Because I don't want you to think I took anything or anything like that. Oh, yeah, my neighbor. They're right downstairs. They can watch you. They can let you in. Great. I go to my boss. Listen, I need to leave for a few minutes. All my cases are cool. I need to leave for a few minutes and um, go to a patient's home and get them clothes. No. I said, okay, I'll do it on my own time, on my lunch. No. 
I said, so you're willing to let me discharge this woman with no clothes? Well, you know what they can do? They can just put a bunch of blankets on her and send her home. She doesn't live far, right? (laughs) Yeah, she lives around the corner and that little amulet is going to be a $75 ride for less than a mile. I said, okay, okay. But I argued with my boss that day and I got written up and I don't care because I was like, you know, my mom, my grandma always used to say something to me. God rest her. You can't go wrong doing the right thing. And yeah, I got written up, but I don't care. How do you treat somebody like that and be okay with it? And then have the nerve to send her a survey and say, oh, give us the best marks. (laughs) Excuse my language, but you can kiss my ass. Yeah, that's terrible. (laughs) You know, forgive me, but that's how strongly I feel about it. I, I, oh, you know, it's been, there's so many horror stories out here. There really is. And You've got people dying in the ER, you, you know, waiting for service. You've got medical errors. And my program helps people arm themselves against the ills of healthcare. Well, that's just what we stuff. definitely need. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you want to um, see some of my marketing materials, I can definitely send them to you. And I can also, did you get a chance to look at my website? No, but I will do that when we're done. Okay. Like I said, okay. it's been insane. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, oh, you don't have to tell me. I know. I've got a 13 year old diva that needs everything in the world to go back to school with. And uh, <laughs> I got a soft spot for that kid. Oh, but that's anyway. good. My, my daughter was never, she's never been girly. So I never, uh, I never had to deal with that. But man, we always had to go spend a hundred bucks at the bookstore. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> I make the joke. It. I always, you know, they always said, well, you got to do this and help them learn language and you need to read to them. Trust me, there were days I was sorry I taught that kid to read and speak. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I know. I was like, I was looking for all her, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Ground landmarks, ground, ground, whatever steps yeah. for them. And I was like, oh, I can't wait till she can talk. And then one day I was feeding her and she said, mommy. And I was like, oh, my God, it's great things. That's nice bread. Oh, my God. Now? <laughs> I was like, please shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. And then you got uh, the, then I got the mom with the dementia that's always asking me the same question. So, yeah, it's like, we fun. <laughs> I know. I know. I had this one lady with dementia in the nursing home. She came up to me and she said, honey, we getting ready to go to the juke joint. I was like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I said, let's go. I'm ready. Hey, you know, yeah. I mean, you, to, you know, from what the trainings that I, I had, and that's another thing, poor training for people, especially in memory care. You have to know what's going on here. Yeah, and it's and because everybody with Alzheimer's is a hundred percent different than everybody else. I mean, I I experienced that just dealing with the few ladies that I deal with when I visit mom, and it took me a little while because I didn't feel comfortable. There, the gal, like I said, the one that lives next door to my mom is Irish, and when she speaks, it's a combination of mumble. Gaelic or whatever it is in Ireland and English. And so Uh it's impossible most of the time to understand what she's trying to tell you, which frustrates her, which I understand, you know, having had a kid and a toddler, I I remember those days, but I tried really hard at first. I just kind of nodded and, and suggested she go talk to somebody else. But now I, I try to do what I can for her because you know, they, there's just not enough people. So I, yes. I try to do what I can do. And I don't know. I gave her a big hug yesterday. That was probably, probably plenty. Helped her with her shoe. Her, her shoe had fallen off. <laughs> you know, cause yeah. there's just, they have like the minimum staff and this place isn't cheap. So. Oh, you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell me. I know. Believe me. And uh, people pay 
thousands of dollars a month per person to get the substandard care that a lot of them get. And that's just wrong. Yeah. No, we're, we're blessed that, um, where she's at is good, you know, but I would never, I'm always a little nervous. Like I said, in June, my husband and I were gone for a week at a convention. And when that Monday rolls around, I'm, I'm just a little bit nervous because I'm not there to check in and, and, you know, she's my mother. She's my responsibility more than theirs is my opinion. I mean, I know we're, you know, mom is paying lots of money for the, to be there. And and they're good, but I still get nervous because I just, you know, you hear horror stories all the time. And Absolutely. I'm afraid I'm going to come in one Monday and, and be confronted with some drastic horror story like with my dad in the hospital when they were more interested in discharging him than helping us figure out what to do with him. Exactly. And that is the way it works. It, it's going to work that way as long as we have a system that supports quantity over quality of care. As long as we have that, that's the way it is. It permeates elder care. It permeates all the different systems that are related to health care, you know, and it's just, a, it's a tragedy. It's an American tragedy. And I know that sounded cliche, but it truly is. It's really very sad. You know, people pay hundreds, thousands of dollars a month just to have insurance. Then you've got to pay the deductible. And then you've got to pay the cover charge to go see the doctor, which is your copay. Yep. And none of that goes towards your deductible and co-insurance and this and that. I remember a time where I went to a doctor. It was either Blue Cross or something else. And that was it. How's the family? How's everything going? That was part of our doctor's appointment. You know, oh, I saw your grandmother at the grocery store. Now, you're lucky if you get a good five minutes. So patients and caregivers have to be prepared. They have to know what they need to ask, addressing issues in that five to seven minutes you get with the doctor. It's sad. Everybody will suffer because of it. And I'm just trying to do my little part to make sure that patients and caregivers know, hey, listen, it doesn't have to go that way. You know, so forgive me for talking your ear off about it, but I'm, I, I really this gets my blood pumping. I love this stuff. I hope you enjoyed the first half of this lengthy conversation. Stay tuned next week where we discuss even more details about becoming healthcare literate, how a healthcare advocate can help you navigate some of our atrociously broken systems so that you and your loved ones get the absolute best care that you can. Definitely check out her website. The link is also in the show notes. And I will talk to you again with Tiffany next week. There's so much useful information out there and so much we need to know to take care of our parents and our own families. And I know sometimes it's really hard to gather all this information together in a short period of time in a way you can access easily. And that's the whole point of this podcast. I share what I've learned taking care of my parents and especially my mom and all the researching of information I do for these podcast episodes. I hope you're finding them useful and hopefully a little entertaining as well. If you are, could you do me a favor? Can you go to Apple iTunes and leave a rating or even a quick review? This is how new people find my podcast and I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know about me. As always, I'll chat with you again next week. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? 
You can get more information by visiting their website at mbkseniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400.